All right, let's go ahead and get started. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, first things first. Uh, we're not going to cover the Chipotle assignment, and we can thank Section 101 for this. Uh, there was crickets when I asked for people to help uh, explain the assignments, and I was already talking to the TAs about implementing a different policy this semester, so I decided we're just going to go ahead and do it this way. So, starting next week, 2% of your group project grade will be, each of your groups will be assigned one homework assignment, 10 to 15 minutes at the beginning of class, to give the answer to and to teach the rest of the group the answer to that homework assignment. So rather than me just tell you about it, you are going to teach everybody in here the answer as part of your group projects. So starting next week, <clears throat> teams 1, 8, depending on section, uh, 14, and 21 will be responsible at the beginning of next week's class, next Monday, February 20th, for explaining the EIC section and helping everybody understand the EIC section. And where this particularly broke down was on Chipotle's point one um, beta, which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So part of your answer has to include what to do when companies have data that doesn't make any sense. And particularly Chipotle's point one beta doesn't make any sense. So I'm not going to say that we're going to grade you incorrectly for the answer, but those four teams will not only give you the answer, but they'll explain what you need to do as an alternative when you get a company's data that doesn't make any sense. Teams two, eight, sorry, two, nine, 23, and let's see, 15 will be explaining the economic conversion assignment. So they'll give you the solution to the economic conversion and help you with any of your challenges on CFI or economic profit that we were going to be going over in class today. And so throughout the rest of the semester, each team will be assigned a different week to explain the results of the homework. The first ones will start next week. You will get a group grade. Your entire group is responsible for this. You can decide how you want to do it. And there will be a group <coughs> um, assessment, meaning if there's no participation by your group members in helping you do the assignment, then you'll basically put this on a form and that those people will get a zero on that assignment. So you must participate in a group in explaining the answers. So even though you might only have one or two people do it, the whole group must help everybody get ready to do the explanation for that group assignment. Questions on any of that? We start next Monday. Yes? So homework Homework's being done individually regardless. So you've already done the EIC assignment. You will do the economic statement conversion individually. If you are the two groups in this section, then the first group will say, okay, here's the answer. And they will collectively give an answer and go through the assignment and explain why it's the right answer each part of the assignment. And for Chipotle, when they have the crazy beta, explain why, even though that's technically the correct answer, how they would adjust for a company with a crazy beta like Chipotle it doesn't make any logical sense. And then the other thing is they'll do the five forces analysis for current and the future and explain the rationale for that. Then the next team will come up and they'll say, okay, here's the solution for the economic statement conversion with the balanced statements. And particularly, here's the challenges that you would have had with CFI and economic profit. And if anybody in the room doesn't understand how to get those statements to work, then that team will be responsible for explaining to them how it works. But individually, they would have done those assignments. They would have turned them in. Simultaneously, each of those groups will work on the teaching element of this. Right. So <clears throat> we'll start that with those two teams in each of the sections next Monday. And then after that, as we have more homework assignments, other teams will get to join in that exercise. All right. So <clears throat> I was already thinking about this with the TAs because we're worried that some people have already said they're having trouble getting their groups together. Well, this solves that problem. And the other issue is that it will force you to basically make sure you understand the, the concepts rather than just passively listening. So because to be honest with you, if you have to teach something, you'll understand it far better than if you actually have to do it yourself. So I actually think it will help you with understanding of some of these challenging concepts. All right. So I think it'll be fun. It'll be a great exercise. And I will grade you as a group on how you do the teaching. So if you do a bad job, you'll lose the credit for the teaching. So make sure you do a good job. All right, questions about any of that? Okay, great. <clears throat> so let's start out with today, economic statement conversion. So I put up lecture note three. We're gonna be going through lecture note three, which is your next, um, one of your next two homework assignments, which are due next Monday. So <clears throat> let's talk about that. We'll hold off the Chipotle homework assignment until next Monday. 
<clears throat> so I told you this was going to be one of the more challenging classes of the semester. <clears throat> this is what we're going to call economic statement conversion. So the idea is <clears throat> valuation, intrinsic value, is the sum of a company's future cash flows. So what we have to do is we have to forecast those future cash flows, and we need the cash flows in a format that is forecastable. So the challenge that we have is we start with accounting statements, gap accounting statements, and we need to put them into an economic format. That economic format is called Medigliani-Miller, and it's represented by this graphic on this slide. And what Medigliani-Miller says is that when it comes to value, the cash value of a company is going to be broken into two components. Bucket one is called operating value. Okay? Bucket two is called non-operating value. If you add those two buckets together, you get something called enterprise value or the EV of a firm. Okay? So, company's worth the sum of its future cash flows. We're going to divide those cash flows into operating and non-operating. So let's take a look at Apple, who just reported its results. So here's how I want you to start thinking about a company differently. So if we go to Apple, U.S. equity, they're at $134 a share approximately, and their market cap today was right around $700 billion. First company to pass $700 billion in market cap. So when they reported their earnings, if you look at their balance sheet, you can see here on key stats as well, Apple now has $238 billion worth of cash. Excuse me, cash. $238 billion worth of cash. So here's the way I want you to think about Apple. If Apple's market cap is $700 billion, then the operating value of Apple is $700 minus $238. Okay? Because that's the actual value of making iPhones and iPads and computers, etc. Okay, so that would be whatever that number is for <clears throat> what do we call that 462. So they have about 462 billion of operating value and 238 billion dollars worth of non-operating value. Okay, so the, the value of Apple is the two together. Okay, but what we're going to do is we're going to say. The operating value is the cash primarily that comes from customer revenue selling products and services on a recurring basis. And then we're going to say, but companies have other things that have nothing to do with selling their products, a bunch of cash sitting in the bank, or maybe some passive joint ventures that they own. But they have value too. We're just going to value them separately. And these things are going to grow at different rates when we do our valuation. Okay? So... That's the idea of Medigliani Miller. So putting the company's assets and liabilities and income statement items into operating and non-operating categories. Sum the two equals enterprise value. It is that enterprise value which is the cash available to pay off the debt and the equity stakeholders. Debt gets paid back three, bucket first, that's bucket three. What's ever left, residual value goes to shareholders, bucket four. Therefore, enterprise value is also the cash available to the debt and the equity holders. Okay? So, <clears throat> we're going to use a mnemonic, right? because I used to teach in the analyst training program at McKinsey, and I had about four hours to teach people who knew nothing about finance. They could be English majors or engineers how to do what we're going to do today. So, I had to come up with a simple way to get them to categorize things. And this is Joe's mnemonic. You're not going to find it anywhere else. But I still use it today, and you will probably find it helpful as we go through this exercise. So, <clears throat> arbitrarily, operating cash flows, bucket one. We're going to call those ones. Arbitrarily, non-operating cash flows are going to be twos. Debt cash flows, threes. Equity cash flows, fours. Therefore, one plus two equals enterprise value. Three plus four equals enterprise value. One plus two minus three equals four. Equity value. That's enterprise DCF. Take your enterprise value minus the debt. Whatever's left goes to the shareholders. Divide by shares, share price. Enterprise DCF valuations are actually very straightforward when the cash flows are in this format. And the analytics associated are very straightforward when they're in this format. So today's class is about how to put those statements into this format. And that will be your upcoming homework assignment. And by the way, half your midterm exam. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and start a graphical representation of what we're about to do. <clears throat> so here's the idea. 
Three-step process. We start with gap accounting statements, income statements and balance sheets, and we want to convert them into economic statements. So <clears throat> here's the first conversion. It doesn't matter whether you start out with the income statement or whether you start out with a balance sheet. You must convert both of those statements. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to convert them into the economic format. So with the income statement, we're going to start first, just arbitrarily, and we'll say, okay, we'll take the income statement and we'll label anything that's operating. Any operating items in the income statement get netted together, and that's going to be called no plat. Any non-operating items in the income statement are going to be netted together, and that's going to be called our non-operating income. Add the two together, and you get something called TII, Total Income Available to Investors. And it is that TII that we can then distribute that income to the other two stakeholders, the debt and the equity. So then what we'll do is we'll take our debt, our interest expense, and we'll put that there. And then we'll take the net income, which is the bottom where the income statement ends, and that's the payment to the shareholders. And the TII will equal the interest expense after tax plus the income to shareholders. And so what we'll have is a balancing TII, a rearranged statement in the economic format. We'll do the same thing with the balance sheet. Balance sheet is called TFI, Total Funds Available to Investors. So the idea is we'll take the operating items on the balance sheet, we'll net them, and that'll be called invested capital or operating invested capital. We'll take the non-operating items in the balance sheet, non-operating capital. We'll add the two together, Total Funds Available to Investors, TFI. And that will equal the debt, interest-bearing debt on the balance sheet, and all the equity on the balance sheet. So again, we'll have a rearranged, balanced balance sheet. And for those of you that watched the Lego Batman movie, <clears throat> the idea is if you take a Lego and you rip it apart and you put it back together or something else, no Legos on the floor. Because we're dealing with footed statements, balancing statements, when we rearrange them, they must also balance. An unbalanced statement is a mistake because it means we forgot to put something on the statement. So the way we're going to balance is each of these statements will have two sides and you must get both sides correct in order to have a correct answer in this class. Now, <clears throat> once we do those two statements, we're ready to create statement number three, which is the cash flow available to investors, CFI. And this is the most important statement. And we cannot create statement number three until we've created the first two. That's what I said, the first two don't matter which order, but you need them both to create the CFI. So, CFI. <clears throat> Trick. CFI is doing the same thing four times. Cash flow is cash from the income statement minus the change in the balance sheet. So we're going to apply that principle four times to the CFI statement. Free cash flow is the operating cash flow. No plat minus change in invested capital equals free cash flow. Then, non-operating profit from the income statement minus change in non-operating items in the balance sheet equals non-operating cash flow. Free cash flow, which is operating cash flow, ones plus twos are non-operating cash flows, equals cash flow available to investors, CFI. Then, <clears throat> that equals the cash that we can distribute to the debt and the equity holders. All right. This CFI is a one period cash flow. If we then forecast this into the future, forecasted free cash flows, operating value. Forecasted non operating cash flows, non operating value. Forecasted two together, enterprise value. Either operating plus non operating value, or you can actually forecast the CFIs directly to get to our enterprise value, right? Then that equals the cash available to the debt holders. Cash to debt was interest expense minus change in debt. One period cash to debt holders forecasted total debt cash flow. Interest expense is the debt. Dividends of the share cash flow. Dividends plus change in equity is the equity cash flow. Forecasted equity value or enterprise value minus debt cash flow equals equity value. A couple of different ways to get there. But that's the point. Once we put this into the Medigliani Muller format, it's much more straightforward about what's happening with the company. We get much more insight, and that sets up Enterprise DCF. 
It also sets up the analytics. For example, ROIC, no plat divided by invested capital. We have a clean no plat, we have a clean invested capital, right? And it gives you a nuance for analytics that you don't get anywhere else. Because what you've learned up to this point coming into this class is not ROIC. What you're going to quickly learn is what you've learned is TII, <clears throat> so it's total income available to investors, on total funds available to investors. It's actually not ROIC. Everybody calls it ROIC, but it's actually not technically ROIC. And I'm going to give you an example of this. So on the next slide. The next slide is a representation of what I'll call the two views of ROIC. On the left is the way you were taught ROIC and the way ROIC is used in the real world. I'm not saying it's technically wrong. It's just different. Okay? And what it does is it, ROIC, invested capital, is the debt and equity of the firm. And so therefore, it's the return on the debt and equity of the firm. And it is the return you get as an investor if you give the firm the debt and the equity. That's called invested capital or capital employee. But here's the nuance. What we're going to do is we're going to take the assets, the total assets of the firm, because if I do the debt and equity, that equals, by definition, all of the assets minus the non-interest bearing liabilities, and we're going to break them into operating and non-operating. Okay? So we're going to have a return on the operating assets, and we're going to have a return on the non-operating assets, as opposed to a return on the total assets. Okay? That's the nuance. And that gives us very powerful insight. Here's an example. So let's say that you're evaluating a company like Molson Coors. Ticker symbol tap. Here, under RV, and I'll use the default analyst curated companies on this list. That's fine. Here is the spread for these companies based on the RV section. So we have the ROIC for the industry, market cap weighted average, we have the WAC for the industry. First company down is Molson Coors, right? Which makes Coors Light, Molson Golden, Coors, etc. Right? So is this an attractive industry? Yes. Is Molson Coors creating value? No. They also don't have competitive advantage. Right? So Everybody see why they're destroying value? All right, think back to the key value driver equation. Should Molson Coors grow? Will growth hurt Molson Coors? Everybody see that? So slow down the growth. All right, so this actually happened. So two years ago, they were running, a, three years ago, they were running a conference in at uh, the Weston Hotel in Fort Lauderdale, and I was brought in as an outside speaker to talk to their top 150 leaders. And... <clears throat> Here's the gist of it. They looked at very similar data. It hasn't changed too much in the last couple of years, except for the ROIC. It used to be about 3%. Now it's up to almost 5%. But basically, they had a negative spread. And so the message was, what about growth? If you have a negative spread, what happens when you grow? You destroy value. That's what I was there to explain. And basically, they were getting ready to take a machete to their business and whack away a bunch of their assets to basically fix the business before they, they grew. So I was up in front of the stage, and by the way, you just have to understand <clears throat> that a, a beer annual meeting in February in South Florida is just like a bunch of spring breakers, except instead of a bunch of 20-year-olds, you just have a bunch of 40 and 50-year-olds that are drinking, listening to rock music, having a good time. In fact, right outside the conference room, they had all the beer, and you could just drink it, and it was the middle of the day. It was, it was a grand old time. And I was there kind of as the angel of death to say, oh, by the way, you guys are the worst performing financially beer company in the world in a golden age of alcohol. You're destroying value and growth is killing you. Oh, by the way, go have another beer. So that was pretty much the message I was asked to deliver. But that's not quite the message I delivered looking at this date. Here is a better message for Molson Coors. Sitting on the stage, talking to the top 150, including CEO, boards on there, all the operating leaders that make beer. So I'm talking to people that make beer. You guys are doing a phenomenal job. Keep up the good work. Increase the growth. Don't slow it down. Because you're creating a lot of value. 
Now, you're probably looking at this and saying, how could he possibly have made this statement? Because this is the flaw of ROIC. What is this ROIC? What does this represent? The return on what? The invested capital, which is the return on the debt and equity, which means the return on all of Molson Coors' assets. It doesn't break it into operating and non-operating. I knew Molson Coors had a big joint venture with SAB Miller. Okay, Does that have anything to do with making beer for the people in the room? People in the room don't run the joint venture. People in the room actually make beer for Molson Coors. And the joint venture was mixed in with their actual beer business. So what I did is I separated out the beer business and I separated out the operating performance from the joint venture where they put hundreds of millions of dollars in this joint venture and I looked out the non-operating investment because if I average those two, I get to the overall average of the business. That is called operating ROIC. This is the operating ROIC of Molson Coors, which is the profit on the beer business divided by the assets associated with the beer business. It is 14%. Do I want to tell them to stop doing that? So that's the misleading part of ROIC. If I were a mediocre analyst, just doing what I learned in business school, looking up in Bloomberg and being lazy, and doing what every banker in the world that you work for will tell me to do, I would miss the point and I would give them the wrong answer. And if you wonder why McKinsey's good, this is what makes McKinsey good. Because the typical investment bank would come in there, be like, we're going to break this business up, we're going to shut you down, we're going to sell off these plants, because you guys are destroying a lot of value. And they're right. What McKinsey would say is, but the operating assets are not the problem. So don't start shutting down the beer business because the operating assets are making 14%. Could they be improved? Sure. They're doing a little less than maybe some of the other assets in the industry, but they're still creating value, and slowing down that growth is actually going to hurt the company. And the real problem in Molson Coors is what? What does this highlight? What's the real problem in Molson Coors? It's the non-operating assets. Fix the joint venture. So if they stop investing in this black hole of a joint venture and they basically focus on selling beer, what's going to happen to the ROIC over time? And therefore, that's the difference between a buy and a sell. And I'm telling you, analysts will get this wrong because they will learn what you've already learned in business school. And that's what's different about this class, and that's what's different about this approach. And I'm not saying they were wrong, but what I'm saying is what they were taught is a traditional ROIC, which is used in Bloomberg as a standard field, by the way. You don't see these custom operating fields in Bloomberg until your next homework assignment where you'll have to put them in. So that's actually a preview of your upcoming homework assignment. But basically, that's the insight that I want to start, you to start having about a business over time, is that those operating and non-operating performances are different levels, and they will grow at different rates. And so if Molson Coors actually focuses on their operating ROIC and fixes the joint venture, then the ROIC will go up over time and they will improve their performance. Versus if Molson Coors says, we have a company that's earning 4% and we need to slash and burn everything, they will actually do worse for the business because they will avoid value creating opportunities because they'll misunderstand what's really happening at their business. And I'm telling you, we can figure this out with publicly available insights. That's why we're doing what we're doing. Okay, So back to this. Let's start the economic statement conversion. So in the slides, we're just going to randomly start with the balance sheet. And I put on Elms a file called, it's in the file section, uh, conversionvideo.xlsx. Okay? So that is the file. And it's specifically this file. So let's start the process. Now, first thing about the process, you'll notice it says labels. In this class, we're going to arbitrarily label operating's one, non-operating two, debt three, equity four. That's again a labeling process if you talk about it outside this class, nobody will know what you're talking about. It's just to help you. But I do it today. So, for example, in March, <clears throat> just written an article, and we're going to come out with the Global 1000 Productivity Rankings based on and give awards based on this through Duke University. So it's going to hopefully be a big deal. comes out in about a month. My TA, myself, and another faculty member who actually used to, again, consult with McKinsey, basically we're taking this approach. We're going through Bloomberg. And we're actually creating an algorithm where we list 
every item that is that Bloomberg reports that's operating and non-operating so we can actually break out the two and do a true cycle time based on operating assets. What's ironic is Bloomberg doesn't even have its own mapping to its statements, and we actually went through over the last 30 days and we've remapped the entire Bloomberg database to be able to do this. So, <clears throat> long story short, in order to do this, we're using the exact same process I'm teaching you because it helps us. So, ones, twos, threes, fours. Label everything because when you rearrange, it'll help you keep track and it'll make the statement conversion much easier. Yes, sir. Can you just say again what the labels are? So, one, operating, two, non-operating, three, debt, four, equity. Just follows Migliani Miller. Right, just those four buckets. I'm just naming the buckets. One, two, three, four. So, cash, one, two, three, and four. In this example, it's a one, but it'll be a one or a two. Co companies have to keep some amount of cash in their business, otherwise they will go bankrupt. Right? So the cash that they have to keep to run the day-to-day -day operations, they can never pay out as a dividend. That's called operating cash. And they will have excess cash, which is the cash that can be distributed. Operating cash is a one, excess cash is a two. In this simple example, since they didn't break it out in the book, we're just going to call this operating, so therefore it's a one. Okay? But on your homework, you'll have to distinguish between one and two cash. Inventory, one or two? One, operating. Anything that supports sales. I need this to generate the next sale. Inventory I need. Net property plan equipment. One, operating. Equity investments in another company. Two, non-operating. Accounts payable. One, it's part of working capital and it supports the inventory. It's the unpaid inventory. So therefore, it's, it's basically a one. It's operating. Interest-bearing debt. Three, by definition, that's what debt is. Anything interest-bearing goes in the debt category. It doesn't matter whether it's short or long-term. Retained earnings. That's equity. Four. <clears throat> so, let's rearrange. Create new tabs. Do the same thing for your homework assignment. I'll call this tab TFI. Make it a little bigger so you can see. Copy and paste. a little smaller. Okay, so equals, get my years. So first section, I want to take all my operating assets, all my operating liabilities, I want to put them in one place, I want to net them together. So equals, all my ones, cash, Inventory, net pp and &E. all my one liabilities, accounts payable, and then I want to net them, equals the assets added together, minus the liabilities. That gets me operating invested Capital, also known as invested capital. Okay. And the important part is you'll notice the symmetry of all the ones together. This is how I mitigate my mistakes because I don't want to put the wrong item in the wrong section. That will be where I make a mistake. Okay. So that is my invested capital. Net my assets against my liabilities. I'm going to do the same thing for the non-operating capital. So I look for any twos that are assets. In this case, it's my equity investments. I look for any twos that are liabilities to net. I don't have any in this example. So when I net them, non-operating capital equals just that. Total funds available to investors equals the operating invested capital plus the non-operating capital. That becomes 
my TFI, total funds available to investors, which I've now rearranged into operating capital and non-operating capital. Well, that's going to be financed long-term by my financing side of the statement, debt and equity. NE3s, debt. NE4s, retained earnings. When I add my threes and fours together, this is what I mean by a balancing statement. TFI balances both ways. To get a correct answer in this class, you must have not only the right number, but you must have a balancing statement. Because here's the point. If I had done this and these two numbers didn't balance, then I only have a 50-50 chance of being right by picking one of them. And I could be lucky, but I don't want to be lucky. I want to be good. So the only way I know I'm good is if I have a balancing statement. So we must balance the statements. So what it means is I have the operating assets and non-operating, ones and twos, always equaling my three and fours in every statement. If I do that, it minimizes my probability of mistakes. Right? And so that's important to this class. So a correct answer is you might have the right number, but a balancing statement is still an incorrect answer. And no partial credit. Right. Questions? Right. Notice also all the ones are together, the twos are together, the threes are together, the fours are together. Generally, when you make a mistake and things don't balance, usually it's you forgot to put something in there. So by labeling it and putting it in the right place, I'm much less likely to make a mistake because I can go back and I can count on the first statement. I had four ones, so I should see four ones on this statement. I could count on the first statement, one, two. I should see one, two on this statement. So it mitigates and makes it easier even when I make a mistake to figure out what's going wrong. You don't have to do the labeling process, but I'm telling you, if you don't do labels, it gets a lot harder. Yes? The non-operating capital is just any of the equity investments. And if I had any liabilities, I would also net those out just like I did invested capital, and I just add the two together. So in this case, since there was no liability, equity investments just equals non-operating capital. All right, I'm going to do the exact same process with the income statement, which is called TII. Total income available to investors, TII. So equals, just get my years across so I can copy and paste. Make it bigger so it's a little easier to see. So take all of my ones from the income statement. So I gotta label them. Let's go back up to the income statement. So revenue, one, two, three, or four. Operating, non-operating, debt, equity. One. That's the whole point. Revenue comes from customers. That's a one. Operating costs. Operating. Operating. That's my one. Depreciation. Where on the balance sheet did depreciation come from? It's a result of what? What did we call the balance sheet? Therefore, we must call it the same thing on the income statement. One, it's operating. And then we get to our operating profits. This is one of the shortcuts I'll let you take is on this statement. Pretty much everything above operating profit is typically operating. I'm not going to trick you anyway before the midterm. So you could actually start as the net, because there could be a lot of operating items, as the one for the operating. Usually the sum categories, you don't count. Okay, Interest expense. Three, that's debt, because it comes from the debt on the balance sheet. Equity income. It's not a four. What generated the equity income? The equity investments. The equity investments are non-operating assets, therefore it's a two. Taxes are a trick. One, two, three. We take the impact of the taxes and we put it into each one of the areas. Net income. Four. That's equity. Now, for purposes of TII, the income statement ends with net income. Right? I'll have the dividends for purposes of cash flow, but the income statement actually ends with net, net income or net profit. <laughs> so let's arrange our TII. Shortcut. 
Start out with the operating section, operating profit. That's one of the few shortcuts I'll let you take easily. So that's my ones. That's the result of my ones. Okay. Now, less tax on operating profit. I'll give you this assumption, but generally, tax rate I'm giving you is 25%. There's an effective marginal tax rate. So, if I pay 25% in taxes, and if I report to the government $280 million worth of profit, then I would pay, on the $280 million, I would pay 25%, which means I would pay 70 in taxes. That gets me my no plat, which is 280 minus the 70, which is 210. You will notice that that is not the taxes that the company actually paid. That is the taxes just on the operating profits. Okay? Now, we do the same thing with the non operating profits. So, equals. We had non operating equity income. If we reported $4 million worth of income, tax on non operating income. We would pay 25% of that in taxes, which means we would have after-tax non-operating income of $3 million, which means we would have total income available to investors, 210 from operations, 3 from non-operating activities, 213. Question about what I just did? Okay, continuing on. 1 plus 2 equals 3 plus 4. I now have to go to my debt and equity, the financing or funds flow side of the statement. Okay, on the threes, I look for my threes off my income statement. Well, that's my interest expense. Now, structure of this statement. It is not a gap statement. It's not a statement you've seen before. It's a map to Medigliani Miller statement. So, convention. Total income available to investors has to balance on both sides of the statement. Therefore, income equals payout. Whatever income I earn is the cash that I'm paying out. Since those two sides have to balance, not through absolute value, but absolutely balance, Payouts are positive numbers. I have income, positive number, therefore I can pay out, positive number on the funds flow side of the statement. I have losses, therefore I must fill that hole. I must borrow and bring in new capital to fund the losses. Losses equals negative payouts, cash coming into the firm. Okay, so with that in mind, should this interest expense positive or negative 20? Needs to be a positive 20. This is where you have to apply common sense in this class. There is not an always, is this number coming from a statement, do I flip the sign or not? This is where you'll break down if you don't understand the concept. And when you do this assignment, it should take you about an hour to an hour and 30 minutes. And what I'll see is I'll see most of the class doing an hour and an hour and 30 minutes. And I'll see some people do five hours and then quit out of frustration. Right? The reason you quit out of frustration is because you have no idea why the sign should be what, and you're just randomly changing signs until you hope it balances. It never does, and then you give up. Okay, Since this is a big part of your homework assignment and also your grade for the midterm and your final exam and the second half of the semester, I don't want you to just be the random num number chuggers. So the point is, every time you see a number, you got to just think about what does it tell you? Is the cash going in or out? If the cash in the financing side of the statement is going out, then it's a positive number. If the cash is coming in, it's a negative number. If I'm paying interest, it's going out. Next, interest expense gets a tax shield. I can write off as a corporation, interest is a cost of doing business. So my tax shield is 
is 25% of the interest expense. Therefore, my after-tax interest expense is 15. Everybody with me? By the way, how much is the company paying taxes? How much is the company paying operating taxes? How much do they pay in non-operating taxes? 70 plus 1? How much do they save in tax yield? 71 minus 5? This is what I mean by splitting out the impacts. So we still net the same taxes the company's paid. The only difference is we're putting the impacts of the taxes in each area. Okay? So 70 million in taxes resulted by generating $280 million worth of operating profit. One million of taxes was generated by four million dollars of equity income. Four million, five million of tax shield was created by having debt in our capital structure. Questions? Asterisk. <clears throat> in the sixth edition of the book, the solution you will notice, which I put in the PowerPoint, is not that number. So I asked McKinsey, Dave Wessel is a good friend of mine, <clears throat> he was one of the authors of the book, known him for 20 years, I said, Dave, what's going on? I don't understand. And basically he said, what we did is we had to make a choice. Because through the first five editions, they did it the same way I showed you, but what they found is that real companies in the real world were having trouble with their accounting systems and actually separating out the taxes into these three areas. So they made a simplification in the sixth edition to, not, to go against the academics and to basically put all of the impacts of taxes on the operating side because it's too hard to create tax yields in the accounting systems of real companies. So they know it was a <clears throat> choice they made to simplify for CFOs and treasurers, right, in the real world practicality. So this is what I mean by you'll understand these things. Like I knew immediately to call Dave and say what's going on because I knew when I did the statements that they were doing it a different way. And it wasn't that they were doing something academically wrong. What they did is they made a choice for expediency to help the clients, right? So that's what I'm telling you as well, that you're going to learn methods that are derivatives of this in other classes. And it doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means they've either made simplifications or they've made different choices in how to do it. But coming out of this class, you'll know that they made a choice that's different, and you'll understand why the choice is being made and the insights that the choice does or does not give you. Doing it this way gives you more insight. Doing that way is a little bit more practical. In this class, we're going to start with the actual and then work towards this, the practical. Okay? So nonetheless, this is what you got to understand. Questions? So I called it old TII. That's the correct answer. This was the shortcut they took. This was the correct answer. By doing it correctly, I knew they created a shortcut. And because I know them, they told me why they did the shortcut. Okay? So, back to this. CFI, statement number three. It doesn't matter whether you do the income statement or balance sheet first, but you have to do the TII and CFI to create statement number three, which is called CFI. So, TII, TFI, create CFI. This slide, which comes from the book, is misleading. On the left, it shows you a gap statement of cash flow. On the right is the CFI. You cannot get from the statement on the left to the statement on the right. It just doesn't work. You can't recreate that statement. You must do the process that I just showed you. So this, think of this as more of a metaphor statement. But the cash flow statement is important because it does give us a key piece of information, depreciation, and dividends. So we can get data off the cash flow statement, but to convert the first two, you don't go from the gap cash flow to the CFI. So back to what I told you the CFI was at the beginning of this session. CFI, income statement minus change in the balance sheet for each section. So just remember, we're going to do that process four times, and that's going to get us CFI. 
Okay. So income statement is TII, balance sheet TFI, TII minus change in TFI equals cash flow. Okay. Four times, once for each section, operating, non-operating debt equity. Okay. So let's convert and create a CFI. Back to Excel. CFI. All right, make it a little bit bigger. Equals, get the years right so I can copy and paste. So, equals gross cash flow as defined in the book. TII, operating cash flow, no plat, plus depreciation. Add back the non-cash items equals what's called gross cash flow. So, no plat, which is off the TII, was 210. Depreciation from the statement of cash flow or income statement was <coughs> negative 20 because I'm adding it back. Change the sign. That's what I mean by I got to use common sense. Equals no plat plus depreciation. Gross cash flow 230, 230 million. Free cash flow. The operating cash flow is gross cash flow minus gross investment. Gross investment formula equals change in invested capital plus current year's depreciation. That's the formula from the book. So, off the TFI, current year invested capital minus previous year invested capital plus current year depreciation, 80. Gross cash flow minus gross investment equals free cash flow. One fifty. Company generated two hundred thirty million of gross cash flow. Eighty million was reinvested, leaving one hundred fifty million of free cash flow. Questions? Yes. <coughs> Change in invested capital. Therefore, current year's invested capital minus previous year's invested capital plus current year's depreciation. Yes. This was all. This is all the operating. These are all the ones. Okay? So these will be ones. By definition, invested capital are all your ones. Change invested capital, change of the ones on the balance sheet. Okay? Next, non operating cash flow from the income statement. Equals from the income statement, TII, after tax, non operating income. So we generate 150 million of free cash flow. We then have 3 million more of non operating income that we can give to our investors. Balance sheet, any twos? Well, we have change in non operating capital. So in this case, our non-operating capital equals went from 15 to 25. We added 10 million in non-operating capital. Now, from a cash flow standpoint, if our non-operating capital went up by $10 million, did that reduce the cash on hand? 
or did that increase the cash on hand? It decreased it, right? Because we're spending the cash to buy the asset. So if I'm adding up to get to a CFI, <clears throat> then I want to change the sign <clears throat> to reduce the capital. So that I generate $150 million of free cash flow. I get $3 million of profit after tax or non-operating income. And I reduce my cash by $10 million because I bought some more non-operating assets. Therefore, I generate cash flow available to investors, cash that I can distribute of $143 million, 143. CFI. Yes. Well, what I want to do is I want to, again, think about what cash flow available to investors means. This is the cash that I can give to my owners. So what I'm trying to do above is I'm trying to say, okay, what adds to that? All right. Well, I added 150 million of free cash flow. Right. Or even more specific, I generated 230 million of cash profit from the income statement. I reinvested in capital expenditures and working capital 80 million. I then had 150 of free cash flow. I got 3 million in non-operating profit. And then I put 10 million into non-operating assets. 150 plus 3 minus 10, 143. I have 143 million left that I can then distribute to my debt and equity holders. Now I'm going to go to the funds flow side of the statement, the financing, and see what did I do with that 143 million? Who got it? Okay? Yes. Would you call non-operating income less increases in non-operating capital um, gross non-operating investment? You could. If it's helpful to change the label a little bit. But that's the point, is that you have an income statement non-operating item and a balance sheet non-operating item. The balance sheet's always a change. So it's, are we adding to or subtracting to between the two periods? Okay? All right, so just like the income statement, TII, CFI, the other side, outflows must be positive numbers. I've generated cash. Where'd the cash go? I'm mapping the two. It's not an absolute value. So starting out with the debt. On the income statement, equals TII, after tax, interest expense. So I took of the 143, I gave 15 of it to the debt holders. That's the interest expense I paid with the tax yield. Then balance sheet, change in debt. My debt went from 225 to 200. So my debt went down by $25. On this statement, if I'm paying off debt, is that an outflow or an inflow? Paying off debt. Outflow. And outflows are positive numbers. So i got to flip the sign. This is what I mean by the potential frustrating part of your homework. You must think this through. So it's not, should this be positive or negative? It should just be, okay, what direction is the cash going? If the cash on this side of the statement, the debt and equity side of the statement, the TII, debt and equity, as well as the CFI, it's called the funds flow or financing side of the statement. The book is using those terms interchangeably. On this side of the statement, because I'm matching, this is not gap accounting. I generate cash, I pay out cash, the two are being tracked equally. Therefore, cash generated equals payouts. Because I generate cash, I can afford to pay it out. That's the way these statements are structured. That's Medigliani Miller. I have negative cash flow on one side, I need to finance it. Therefore, negative equals negative. Okay. So, change in debt, payout 25. Next, trick. Trick number one. This is another source of frustration if you don't pay attention and didn't read the book. This is the cash flow statement. Therefore, we're looking at cash flows. Is net income a cash flow to a shareholder? No. What is representative of the income that's paid to the shareholder? What is that actually called? Dividends. Therefore, on the CFI, dividends, not net income. On the TII net income, because we're reorganizing a statement that has to balance. But the actual cash flow is the dividend. Therefore, dividends. Inflow or outflow. 
therefore positive or negative number. Positive number. <clears throat> Finally, change in equity equals retained earnings went from 265 or 170 to 265. They went up by 95. That's retained earnings. Positive or negative number? I'll give you a hint. When we sum these up, I need to get 143. That's negative. That's positive. Trick number two. This is the statement of cash flows. Cash flow available to investors. What is retained earnings? Is retained earnings a cash account? No. A change in a non-cash account does not have a change impact on the CFI. Retained earnings and change retained earnings is not part of CFI. And therefore, if you put it in there, you'll never get your statement to balance. So this is for the people that are going to take five hours and get frustrated. So on the CFI, number one, got to be careful about your signs. Okay, You just have to think about it. On the asset side of the statement, is it adding or subtracting to the CFI? Right? Is it helping me get more cash to pay out or taking away from the cash that I pay out? On the funds flow or financing side, the debt and equity side, if it's being paid out, it's a positive number. If it's a borrowed money, it's a negative number because negative borrowings fund losses. Positive profits allow me to pay out to the investors. That's the way that statement is structured. Trick number two. On the TII, it's net income. On the CFI, it's dividends. It's cash flow. Trick number three, change of retained earnings. Non-cash equity accounts. Changes in non-cash equity accounts are not on the CFI because they don't affect cash flow. And if you put them on there, then you're going to struggle because then you'll have cash and non-cash accounts on a cash flow statement. Yes? How about um, equity issuance or share buybacks? Is that a cash flow attached to that? then it would absolutely be on there. So share buybacks would be called treasury stock. So in that case, a change in treasury stock would be a positive number on this statement. An issue of stock, increase in common stock at par value, that would be a negative number on this side of the statement. Absolutely right. Because that's a real cash flow. Same thing with preferred. This statement doesn't have preferred, but if you have preferred, same thing. Preferred dividends are positive. Increases in preferred stock are negative. Decreases in preferred stock, actual stock itself, are positive numbers because you're actually paying off the principal. Statement number four. <clears throat> so back to the statement. Operating cash flow, non-operating cash flow, CFI. In fact, if I wanted to, I could put another line in here. Another row. Call this non-operating cash flow equals the and then I could make my CFI the operating plus the non-operating. You get the same answer. I'm writing it out line by line, not taking shortcuts because it will help you as you understand what's happening, what's going on with these statements. All right, statement number four, economic profit. Economic profit is also known as economic value added. Stern Stewart trademarked EVA, so we can't use EVA. So everybody else calls it economic profit, but it's basically economic value added. So again, how do we calculate EVA or economic profit? So I need... Historical data for two years, prior and current. Now, in this class, we're going to do BOY, ROYC. 
So to get our ROIC, BOI ROIC, we need our NOPLAT off the TII. We need our invested capital off the TII. And our BOY ROIC equals current year NOPLAT divided by previous year invested capital. BOY stands for beginning of year. <coughs> EOY, end of year ROIC, would be current year NOPLAT divided by current year invested capital. Okay, So we're going to do beginning of year invested capital just arbitrarily. But that's what you need to do to get a correct answer on your assignment. Okay, So that gets us something like 55%. So here's how I do economic profit. <clears throat> so what I do is my I need a whack, and we'll just say arbitrarily it's 10%. So I can get a spread is my ROIC minus my whack. Oh, why is this doing this? Okay, it's about 45.3. So my economic profit, which is my spread times invested capital. So equals the 45.3 times my operating invested capital for last year, 172. Method number two equals no plat, which is off the TII, minus what's called the capital charge. Capital charge is my WAC times my invested capital from last year, beginning of your invested capital. So if I have 380, I have to make 10%. I need to make 38. I made 210. The difference between the two is my economic profit. 210 minus 38, 172. Balancing economic profits. Four statements for balancing. One period change in value is EVA. One period change in value is economic profit. The one period change in value for this company is $172 million. So they actually created $172 million in value because they made a 45% spread. Yes? Capital charge is whack times IC. And again, this will be posted online, the spreadsheet, and the video associated with the spreadsheet. Other questions? This completes your next homework assignment, which is due one week from today. Okay. So here's deal. Let's go online. A couple things. Number one, if you go to the assignments tab, this is called homework four and on homework four that is the spreadsheet that you're going to have to convert so same process four tabs it'll be easier for you to do it in the four tabs one tab per state TII, TFI, CFI, EP okay balance each statement and it'll help you if you use relative references so you can copy and paste just like I did now when you go through this homework four this is the file that you'll see. I've given you some assumptions down here. Make sure you pay attention to those assumptions. Tax rate, WAC, et cetera. Use B-O-Y-E-P. And you have three years worth of data instead of two years worth of data. Okay? So it doesn't matter. Just copy and paste an extra column. Actually, having more years shouldn't take you any more time to do the assignment. Okay? Now, you're going to have basically three years of TII, three years of TFI, two years of 
CFI because you need a change in the balance sheet and two years worth of economic profit because you're using last year's invested capital. Okay, so <clears throat> final thing, I'm giving you the labels on this assignment. So you don't have to decide because you're probably not familiar with operating, non-operating yet. I'm telling you what's operating and non-operating. So put these things into the right category based on what I told you that they are. All right? And don't forget on the income statement to split out the tax impacts. Questions? This is an individual assignment due for all sections next Monday, 10 a.m. Now, here's the new nuance. So teams 2, 9, 16, and 23. So in this section, I believe there's team 9. Where's team 9? So at the beginning of class next week, you're going to have 15 minutes to basically go through the solution. So you'll put up the Excel solution. <coughs> I'm not giving it to you, so you hopefully you got it right. And then you'll teach the class how you got the Excel solution, answer any questions they have on the problems that they have, and teach them the theory of the economic statement conversion homework. Okay? So where's team 1? Or sorry, team eight. Okay, you have EIC. And in particular, you're going to do the Chipotle EIC. More importantly, the five forces. And like I said, Chipotle's got a crazy beta. It doesn't make sense. So here's the homework with the beta as done. That's how you're being graded. But they are, their beta is like 0.1. That doesn't make any sense. So what type of beta should we use when we have one that doesn't make any sense? Because I think there's a lesson learned in that as well. Okay. So that'll be the beginning of next Monday's class. Now, you're not going to have class on Wednesday because Wednesday you're going to have a Bloomberg Lab homework. So you have two homeworks due. These are individual homeworks, right? So including those two teams, you will still do the homework yourselves, even the members of the teams. As a team, you'll then get an answer and then basically explain it to class. But you still do the homework yourselves. Everybody's got to learn how to do this stuff. So this is the other homework assignment. I'm going to give you approximately 10 custom fields to put into Bloomberg. You guys did your certification, you know how to create a custom field. So one of the custom fields, operating ROIC. All right, so just as I showed you in the Molson Coors example, <clears throat> ROIC and operating ROIC, Bloomberg only has ROIC. They don't have operating ROIC. So in order to do operating ROIC, we got to do no plat. We got to do invested capital, specifically operating invested capital using our definition of operating invested capital. We need to do cycle time. Cycle time in days is not a Bloomberg standard field. So we got to create that. And then we got to create the operating ROIC based on that. So you're going to be creating Bloomberg custom fields to create the operating metrics that we just talked about. So in order to do that, I'm going to give you class time on Wednesday to do that. In addition, you're going to use the EQS section of Bloomberg to do the assignment. You guys, do you guys do the equity screening tools part of your certification? Okay, you're smart, you'll figure it out. Here's a primer. So in your Bloomberg terminal, when you create the custom fields, you'll apply them to EQS, which is called the equity screening tool. There are, right now, 887,720 companies in the Bloomberg database, globally. So you can use just about any ratio to screen criteria on that ratio in those countries. So for example, let's say that I want companies in the S&P 500 that are growing at 20% per year, have a 20% ROIC per year. Who are they? So here's what you would do. You'd come to the EQS, add criteria. You would type SPX for the S&P 500. That will narrow down to 505 companies. The reason it's 505 is companies like Alphabet have dual share classes. They're an A and a C class. So there's 500 companies with 505 share listings that make up the S&P 500. Okay? Then you'll take criteria, ROIC, traditional ROIC, as opposed to operating ROIC. Now I'll probably give you an operating ROIC criteria for your screen, but you don't have it in your file yet. That's what you're going to have to put in. That's how I'll know you've done it. But nonetheless, here's regular ROIC, greater than 20%. So right now in the S&P 500, 70 companies have an ROIC greater than 20% on last filing. Then growth. 
Here is revenue growth year over year, greater than 20%. Now in this case, it's an and, meaning that meet both criteria, or I can do an or that make either criteria. I want an and, I want both. So therefore, four companies meet that criteria right now on the S&P 500, okay? I could save the screen, and on my screen set up over here, click on results. These are the four companies, the S&P 500, Chubb, Ulta, Tencore, who I don't know who they are, and NVIDIA, that basically meet that criteria that are growing faster than 20% and have a 20% or greater ROIC. So that would have been your assignment, okay? Except the screening you're gonna have to do is on the custom fields that you're going to have to create. So in order to do that, I'm giving you class time to, to do the custom fields and to do the, the screening criteria. So you'll have Wednesday's class to do it. So no lecture on Wednesday, Bloomberg Lab on Wednesday. Our next class will be next Monday, one week from today. Beginning of class, first team will basically go through EIC, second team will go through the results of the economic statement conversion, and then the rest of the class will talk about the analytics and ratios that come out of that. Okay, questions about any of that? See everybody next Monday. Thank <laughs> you.